And hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of IoT Live. Uh, we're cliffless uh, tonight because he's not feeling particularly well, but we've uh, we've made a fantastic replacement in Sander van der Velde there on the uh, the far, uh, well, I don't know, right-hand side, um, but that way for me. Uh, and then in between Sander and I, we have the awesome Maria Anastasia as well. So hi, Maria Anastasia. Uh, now, I sort of had to rush together the, the scenes for this um, because this isn't sort of the default set of scenes. Uh, and also Sander's um, microphone and headset have decided to, to balk. So he's had to switch sound sources. So if if Sander, if you can't hear him or if he's really low, then let me know. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to fix that as we go along. Um, Maria Anastasia, you should be perfectly fine, but I've moved you around in, in the scenes, you know, in the middle rather than on the end. Uh, so uh, Lord knows if that's made any odds as well. And likewise, if you can't hear me, uh, then let me know as well. But just put it in the chat and um, hopefully um, <laughs> we'll be able to fix any issues <laughs> that we've got. Um, yeah, so a uh, few. Terrible day today, just I didn't get anything done and everything was a rush. Uh, but by the sounds of it, it uh, uh, Sander at least had a similar day uh, to that. So I'm not alone. Uh, Maria Anastasia, how was your day? It was a fine day. It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I started again um, ballet, so... Oh. Uh, it was a it, it was a great day. Thank you. <laughs> ballet again, nice. Yeah. yeah, awesome. My two daughters do uh, ballet and tap, uh, and a bit of just regular dance as well. Uh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> very nice. I, I didn't realise you did ballet. Cool. That's hard. Mm. That's um, yeah, takes a lot of uh, core strength and stuff like that, doesn't it? So yeah, yeah not mm. simple. And so, and Sander, uh, thank you very much for joining us, uh, firstly, uh, in the absence of Cliff, um, who's uh, blowing his nose into a tissue, I believe, at this moment in time. Um, he's a pilot for BA, in case you didn't realise um, uh, by now. Uh, and so he's probably one of the most tested people I know. So it's not COVID, uh, or at least it shouldn't be, um, because he's, he's tested like two, three times a week or something. So, um, yeah, just got a bad cold. Um, it's going around, I believe. So, uh, yeah, um, this is, I mean, we, we came back last week, I think, didn't we? We, we had an episode last week, um, and I'm not sure if we had an episode before that, I can't remember. Or was it two weeks ago? Oh, well, I can't remember. I lose track of time, but um, we've been through uh, the normal way of working is that we have a little chat uh, in a, in a uh, scene like this, if you will, and then we normally switch to my uh, my desktop and... We go through some of the, the links uh, that I've uh, found during the week and also that Maria Anastasia and normally Cliff's found as well. When we have a guest, uh, we like to, to talk to them about what it is they're doing um, and um, have a look at uh, you know some of the, the information that, uh, that Sander wants us to look at as well. So uh, we'll most certainly do that. But I thought we'd start first with uh, with some of the links and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll have a bit of a word with Sander and and see what he's got to say. So if I switch across to my screen, then all being well, you should be able to see that. Um, the first thing I, I found here was, and now a while back, I was, I was, I mean, I'd be speaking to people regularly about this sort of a thing, but a while back I was speaking to somebody about using SQL, and specifically SQL Server, uh, for IoT applications. And it's kind of frowned upon, really. Uh, mostly, I think, because IoT applications tend to have quite a lot of uh, time series based data uh, and SQL Server doesn't tend to be particularly good for time series based data. You know, you should be using something like Cosmos DB or um, or some flat file storage, maybe if, depending on what you're doing. But um, I spotted this learn module here uh, that's advocating using Azure SQL database with IoT solutions. I thought that was quite an interesting talking point. Uh, Maria Anastasia, have, have you done much data storage for IoT yet, or uh, what, what are you being taught at, at university, and, and how does that work? Mm, we have uh, taught about um, um, SQL, but uh, no with Hazard. And now in my first do job, I, um, I started uh, looking... Uh, at all of these mm -hmm. 
and it's very interesting um, how much uh, you can do uh, with uh, these uh, these combination. It is. Uh, I mean, I used um, Azure SQL uh, as well, SQL Server specifically um, for uh, for a client. Uh, but once the data gets too big, then you start needing indexes on columns to be able to search across it. And that's that's one of the reasons why people tend to use something like Cosmos DB, because it gets rid of a lot of those those problems. Uh, what, what's your understanding of this, Sander? Well, um, I use mo both uh, databases in the cloud and on the edge. I'm doing a lot of edge projects. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I was really <laughs> uh, surprised that it's possible to run a SQL Server, as we all know, as a Docker container on Linux devices. So uh, that was one of the first things that I started to do uh, when I needed some databases on the edge. Just take that Docker, uh, that Docker container and hey, I'm up and running. <laughs> Connection string, good to go. But uh, later on, I learned about uh, CrateBay and uh, MySQL and um, InfluxDB, of course. And those are, um, uh, well, uh, I think uh, in, in compared to the old uh, SQL Server con uh, container, uh, much more uh, in place for, for time series data, mm. especially InfluxDB. And, yeah. and and uh, also known, it's also known for people who are not directly Microsoft minded or uh, just looking at generic open source uh, solutions. Um, yeah, I found uh, I was speaking to to Cliff on here uh, a while back uh, about uh, a database. Now let's have a look, see if I can find what it, it was. Uh, let's have a look what it was called. Oh yeah, Time Scale DB. Um, which was a Postgres-SQL-based database. And I, I always forget, and I forgot last week when we were talking about it, but um, it, it's a SQL-based, you know, po Postgres-SQL-based database, but specifically for time series data, which I'd not I'd not heard of before. I was speaking to a client, and they, they mentioned it to me. Uh, you know, so 10 to 100 times faster, which was impressive. <laughs> Yeah, for some reason, all these uh, time series databases are uh, much faster. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but um, that's, of course, how they index and how they um, yeah. store the data inside, uh, column-based. Um, so, um, well, I, I started first uh, looking at MySQL. And later on, uh, I, I looked and I used it with another project, uh, InfluxDB. And it's uh, one of the things that I really like about InfluxDB. It's it's not the golden bullet uh, or the si the silver bullet, but um, it automatically can uh, delete data uh, once it gets uh, old. You can put a policy inside the database, and it will remove old data. That's cool. Depending on the rule that you add. Hmm. Is that quite an easy rule to set up? Yeah, yeah, and it's. Uh, so you're you can you are in control of the size of your database and how old the data is. So you, um, so on an, an edge device that's really interesting, and um, I'm not sure if uh, SQL Azure has the same feature. Um, Auto delete old data. Um, I bet there's. I mean, you can trigger, can't you? So I guess you can set up a trigger and then you could do some form of a stored procedure that would just delete. Data Correct. based on a, a column. Well, I I used a uh, an, an Azure function in, for one project, just oh, an Azure function, and with a timer trigger on it, and well, bye bye all data. <laughs> yeah, until you do it accidentally incorrectly, and then you end up with a Mark Zuckerberg situation. Uh, um, please <laughs> test it uh, twice. <laughs> edge cases, though, you know all about the edge edge cases. Yeah, uh, but geez. <laughs> That's that's uh, the interesting part of storing a, a large amount of data in 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 constructs like like databases. Uh, it's 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 uh, a very heavy construct and a a expensive more expensive construct 
in 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 comparison with um, a, a data lake. Mm. Um, so um, it's better to only keep warm data, data that has some value over time, to keep that in a in a database and uh, yeah, fast access and um, but but remove it or or make, first make a copy of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, because that's that's what we ended up. We didn't delete it. We first took a copy of the uh, the warm data and put that in a uh, blob storage. Yeah, perfect. And if needed, we could put it back into the database. Uh, that's cool. Huh. For for uh, analysis, I guess reasons. Well, to put if it back somebody's in. asking about, well, I want the uh, the graphs, uh, the yeah. the dashboards with the stuff from uh, from two years uh, two years ago. It's just, well, moving it back into the database. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, but I've thought a lot about, I mean, generally I send everything to both um, and then only, like you say, keep um, the most recent data in the warm storage, but just leave blob storage going, you know, as long as it wants, because it's virtually free, isn't it, blob storage, I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things. Um <laughs> Compared to Cosmos DB or, or Data Lake or something like yes. that, you know, it's, yes. <laughs> it's free. Um, but um, I've not thought of, of taking it back out of blob storage and putting it into a, into a warm store to be able to do the analysis under those circumstances. But I guess that makes that makes some sense because querying blob storage is difficult. <laughs> you need to write some code to be able to pull it out and you can't really well, or, or, query it. Or you 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 have to rebuild the the same display the the same uh, charts in in a, a second store or a, se a second yeah. solution. Uh, mm. Why not uh, use the the original solution? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've not even thought of doing that. Um, yeah, it's a clever idea. <laughs> Certainly, if then you can automate removing it again afterwards, then uh, that makes a lot of sense. I like that. That's cool. I've not used uh, Data Lake before, uh, or there's Databricks as well, which I've not really looked at. Uh, no, no, I, I've seen a project where a data scientist was working with it. Um, it's it's uh, it's an open source solution, but uh, Microsoft put a really nice um, um, layer on top of it regarding the cluster. And it's a cluster of uh, de devices, VMs, I, I suppose, mm -hmm. that are set up. And um, I think that's the hard part of Databricks uh, to manage that cluster. But oh. yeah, as always, Microsoft just puts a slider in front of it and uh, there you go. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. Makes it easier, easier to manage. Yeah. Uh, Maria Anastasia, have you started doing any... Um... Microsoft exams. Yes, I I passed the Azure um, fundamentals. Okay, cool. Congratulations. And the Azure uh, Data fundamentals. Oh, ah, so, well, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I have uh, learned the these things that we talked about talked about uh, right now. Uh huh. But um, I haven't um, built all of these. Oh, so... well, who can? Yeah. <laughs> can, can you remember any of it? I, I, I've, I mean, I've been through the exam, I've created exams, and um, I just forget. Uh, does it stay in your head? or? Um, I remember, yeah, I remember the, the basics um, <laughs> that, uh, that the lake is for... Um, for huge uh, data, as I remember, and uh, information like uh, this. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I get it. We say this every week on the show that uh, we, we all just need some more time to actually have a play with these things in anger. Uh, I've been quite enjoying uh, updating my Pluralsight courses, and I know, Sander, you, you and I jumped on a call about uh, one part of it, and then you, you created a great blog post uh, to fill out some of that data. Beat me to it, Arg. Um, <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> it's fine. It's a good blog post. Um, and um, this, yeah, so that, that does give me some time, and someone is essentially paying me uh, to spend some time, but obviously it's very narrow focus. Uh, in fact, today I've been looking at device streams, 
uh, io2 hub device streams have either of you heard of those or looked at them or um that's that's a uh, a uh, solution uh that's already there for for years but it, it, it's still in public preview i believe it is yep but it's in the exam it's in the az220 exam uh, and when i say okay. it's in the exam i don't think there's actually any questions yet um but I've got some questions to make for the latest iteration of the exam, and I need to look to see whether or not this area is one of those um, sections of questions I need to make. Uh, but either way, it's part of the objective domain or OD for the exam. So um, when there's a new section or a new set of sections that added to the exam, I have to then update the plural site courses to map correctly yeah. to that, whether or not there's a question in the exam or not, because it may well come and it'll possibly well. be me creating it. Uh, but yeah, I was looking at device streams and how that works, uh, which is, um, and, and chances are you may not have looked at this because it's quite an edge case. But if you imagine that you've got IoT devices sitting um, behind a corporate firewall, corporate firewalls will probably block most ports other than, say, 80 and 443, the uh, the TCP IP, the HTTP um, uh, ports themselves. So things like 88. Tate three, I think it is, and um, five six seven three or whatever the the AMQP and the uh, MQTT ports said probably blocked, but th also things like um, SSH on port twenty two will be blocked. Now, if you're running a little Linux IoT device and you want to SSH into it, you don't really want to have to keep poking holes in your firewall to be able to get access to it. So, what Device Streams lets you do is that it uses uh, the IoT hub as a proxy. And it feeds whatever traffic you like from whatever port through the IoT hub and down onto the device and back up again. It's quite clever. So you run a service on your host machine that you want to do the dialing in from. And you run a service on the device. And they both authenticate up to the IoT hub. And then um, they, they create a WebSocket connection through something called the streaming endpoint there's another another endpoint on the IoT hub specifically made for this. So then you get a WebSocket connection between these two services and your, say, SSH client will talk to the machine service that's on your machine there. And then that will translate all of that information all the way through the IoT hub using the SDKs so you don't have to write very much code for it. And then that gets sent back down to the service on your IoT device and that then spits that back out on the correct port to your the local SSH service, say, uh, on the device. And the thing's seamless. Once you've got these two things running, authenticated, and you've mapped the correct ports, you, you can just dial in, and it just works. It's quite clever, really. Uh, it took me a little bit of fiddling, because um, uh, the, I think it's fullfat.net, and somebody is, I think somebody's made a, um, a, a pull request and a commit to it that's upgraded the the NuGet packages to use a version of NuGet, uh, using a version of the Azure dot devices NuGet package that doesn't support device streams, which wasn't particularly clever. So I've got I've got to make a pull request and, and ask them to fix that. But um, so I've, I've modified all the code for my plural site course. But either way, um, while we we're on that subject, I thought it'd be interesting to to mention that to people. Well, uh, um, when it was first announced, announced, I I already checked it out. But that's, I think, two years ago. Yeah. Uh, and um, from what I heard, that Microsoft is still having a focus on Azure Device Stream. It, it will be there. Yeah. But um, they had some other stuff to do first. Um, for example, the, uh, the public and private endpoints of the IoT app. Um, that uh, had some um, priority. And, and and on top of that, of course, um, Azure Device Streams uh, should should also work. Ah. Uh, but it's it's in fact it's like a man in the middle uh, solution, yeah. hmm. but in a, in a positive way. <laughs> um, and it's it's it should be ideal for for edge devices to control them without having a VPN uh, connection. Yeah. So we. It uh, the, the 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 device stream is the tunnel, a yes. secure tunnel, um, so that could make life much more easy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, 
that's exactly it. Yeah, there's a whole heap of benefits they've got listed on the on the page. Uh, in fact, let me just get the page up. Um, yeah. There we are. This is this is the uh, um, the the device streams, and, and as Sander says, this is in preview. Has been for a while, and your two year uh, information is exactly right. That's 2019 that this data was written. Um, but I mean, uh, there's a load of words on here, and uh, let me just create a bitly for that and stick it in the chat. So IoT live device streams. I'll stick that in the chat. And then I can stick a link on the screen as well. There we are. So um, if you want to see uh, like a... The, the information here is good, but I don't think it's explained as, as sort of succinctly as it could be. So I've explained it. I will do in my plural site course when, when it's released. And I've also got some nice graphics explaining how that, that process that, that it Please. Goes through works. <laughs> yep. And also I've got a, a full demo um of, of all the bits. I've actually got it laid out on the screen at the minute. Um so um you'll see this demo in the uh plural site course as well and how that works. And then hopefully um I'll beat Sander to a blog about it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I leave this one to you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, it's it's really interesting though. It's it's worth checking out. Um, it, it's one. Of, I think it's one of those things you go. I didn't know I needed that until I saw this, and now I can see that that's way better than putting a VPN on there. Um, and and yeah, you, you quoted that one, and that's in. There's a benefits thing. Here we are. Look, um, and uh, it mentions VPNs. I think in this. Uh, there we are. Look. Um, no need for a complex virtual private network to enable connectivity to, to devices. The other, I like this. The other good thing is that both sides of these services are authenticated to the IoT hub, so um, you know that you've got full control. And the other beauty, beautiful thing is, is that even if the service you're using isn't encrypted at source, as soon as it gets into this tunnel, that whole tunnel is encrypted. So uh, that automatically encrypt unencrypted data and then unencrypt it back on the other side so over the public internet all of this is uh, encrypted which is a great security benefit for free uh, Pete, if if i have multiple uh, clients multiple edge devices how can i uh, prevent that i'm crossing the streams <laughs> so um you you reference this by the device id so um, on each device, I would say you would make a service and then that will authenticate just like the the device does. So that, that handles that side. And then on, on your machine, you'd probably make, uh, well, there's, there's a few different ways, but one way is that you could make multiples of these particular services, each exposing on a different port because you can map whatever outward port yeah. you like. So instead of um, just firing up SSH and, and dialing into the local machine to go through there. You're actually mapping it to say port two 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 two. So I go back to my little um, As demo example. Here. I suppose that's it. Yeah. So you can see I've got on my local machine here. That's a service level connection string. You can see that's what it says there. Service, uh, and that's referencing IoT device one. But the service itself is exposing locally port two 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 two. So I hit port 2222 uh, like that uh, with SSH. Um, but you could have a port 2223 or port 2224 and do it that way. That's probably the simplest uh, way you could do it. But obviously you could build this out with one solution like this and then just create, you know, have a, uh, a for loop in there and just create one of each uh, for each of your devices if you wanted to uh, or literally spin up. It's one of these when you want it and pass in the device ID um, yeah. is another way of doing it. Because chances are you're probably not going to dial into them all together at the same time. Um, so, you know, th this particular example, you, you can either use the environment variables uh, or you can actually pass it in. Instead of doing uh, .NET Run, you can pass in the parameters um, one yeah. by one in there as well. So. And um, the... the we played with this ID. Uh, it, the first versions were not stable, so that's why we abandoned it. Uh, it, it, it run for 30 seconds or one minute or whatever. Oh. I could send two commands and then it was uh, it was down. Hmm. Uh, but the ID that uh, we had was to put uh, the clients in a uh, in a VM in Azure. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, that's a, called a, a jump box. Uh, it's a device, and you go in with other set of credentials. Um, so if people comes into the team or goes away from the team, you just uh, take away their credentials for that uh, the access to the jump box. Yeah, and uh, that keeps the, uh, the the connection secure. And there's yeah, a second so, I mean, set of uh, credentials. You would SSH to pi at and then or whatever the username was at the the URL of the jump box at that point and pass in the port of whatever it was and like you say you could uh, well mind you you still need some form of credentials don't you these this, this uh, with SSH no. you are SSHing directly effectively into the device the, the SSH that, so. client was on, is uh, is put eh? because SSH client is um, that you use um, is in the cloud uh, on the jump box itself. On the jump box, ah, okay. And you you first have to log into into the jump box, and then you can go further on and try to make a connection to one of the edge devices. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and then like you say, you can you can revoke their login to the jump box, and then that's it. They're, they're Correct. Fixed. I like that. That's good. Because if somebody can access the uh, the jump box, then uh, he is almost in god mode if he also knows the uh, the credentials of each connection mm, yeah that'd be bad <laughs> so um having this two steps and with uh, SAD uh, uh around it that's uh that's a nice solution mm. and the and the jump box itself it's available everywhere you don't have to go to a physical device or have to install it on your own uh the client on your own uh, device you just log in remote yeah and that's and uh that could be done with uh how is it called uh bastion yeah then you have a really really secure solution uh. yeah it makes sense i like it there we are do you do much um sshing the uh, maria anastasia is that uh, I'm not sure what devices you prefer to use. Is that uh, are you into Linux devices or is it Arduino or or what? Mm, I'm not sure that that I understand the question. Uh, do you normally use Arduinos or do you do you do like Raspberry Pis or ESP32s or well, that's Arduino really? But you know what I mean. Uh, all of all of them. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. I are. have a. Raspberry right here. Beautiful. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> we love the Raspberry Pi. SSH is the best, said Carl. I've uh, started using Git command line more than UI only because I SSH so much now. Yeah, that's fair enough. I wish I could remember. I do Git, Git clone and Git pull uh, is about all I do on the command line. Uh, and then I do everything else in VS Code or in Visual Studio. <laughs> He's used to typing now. The keyboard is better at everything. Well, is it... You know, it's not better if you can't remember what the command is, um, and then you've got to get your mouse out and go to the browser and <laughs> do a search using your mouse and the keyboard. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe people have got a better memory than me, but people do branching and and uh, branch switching and merging and uh, pushing and uh, committing and everything all in there. Uh, you've got your command history, that's true, up and down keys. But when I've committed, it's like it opens up some clanky blooming editor for you to put your commit message into and it oh i'd far rather just use uh, vs code and i can commit and push just by holding control and percent enter when i finish typing my message in there it, it just seems uh, uh v r v i m well it is yeah especially when you can't get out oh that old joke <laughs> i prefer vs code too yeah good yeah it's yeah. all of the plugins and uh mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a very visual person when I'm I'm doing this. I like to have um, I do I do a whole heap of stuff in SSH. Carl's right, uh, and I remember a lot more Linux command stuff. It's just I've you know not done enough command line uh, Git to make it worthwhile. I, I sat there watching um, Liam Gulliver when we when we were on the other uh, show, the 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 Azure show. Um, and, and he does everything with the command line for Git. Um, and it's like, oh, well, I didn't realize he could do that. Um, <laughs> I just do it all in, in VS Code. It just, it, it's a lot simpler. I mean, I'm assuming that uh, the viewers have, have, what, have used VS Code, but if, if you haven't, then this is VS Code. Um, and this is the source control section here. 
Uh, and yeah, I can just type my git commit commit message in there and hold control press enter, and that'll do the the commit and push directly in there. And um, I can pull changes in here and push changes and, and clone and I can I can switch branches and make branches down here and it's just uh, just feels nice. I like it. I, I'm not sure I could you know create a branch as as fast as I could do it in VS Code by typing it. I'm not sure. Maybe I could. Um, but it feels just like I, you know, it's more obvious. And and look, wh which branch am I in? Oh, mind you, you know, I think you can like prettify. There's something beautify, or you can do something with uh, your consoles to actually show which branch you're in, um, like before the path. I forget what that's called now. Um, VS Code's awesome, says Carl, but only because um, it, it gave you a choice. Yeah, terminal right here, but also nice UI. VS Code is the best uh, editor IDE ever. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's just awesome. Um, when it, whenever I power up uh, full fat Visual Studio, it always just feels a little bit clunky now compared to how fast Visual Studio Code is. Even with all of the different extensions that I've got um, installed in, in VS Code, it's still just fast and works. So look at that. We, we went on a massive detour uh, uh, from databases uh, and we've ended up at VS Code. Um, actually, that's a little bit like that Kevin Bacon thing. I think you can always get to VS Code, certainly if you're in IoT uh, world here. Uh, oh, by the way, the uh, this um, learn module uh, that is, if I uh, that uh, change that, there we are. You can see, and then this uh, that's the link yeah. to that. So uh, I've not been through it actually. I need to I need to have a look at it and see what it is that it, it thinks it's doing. But it's processing oh, IoT actually, data. Sorry, Actually, on. I've done it. I've done it. Um, oh, there we are. And um, there's one tip that I can share is uh, read carefully, oh, because right. at at one point uh, they switch over from um, the the, uh, the Azure Bash um, to uh, to PowerShell, uh -huh. and then they switch back. <sighs> and I didn't read that line, so I tried the PowerShell stuff in my own terminal uh, application. So, um, okay, that was not the smartest thing to do. Uh, <laughs> but um, then I uh, read it again, and uh, okay, now I know what they're, um... what I'm missing. Uh, so <laughs> keep an eye on that one. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. Um... It's. Uh... I, I like the sandboxes. Uh, that is so nice. Yes, how it is. It's really good. And there's one for Git as well. Um, there's a, a Cloud Skills Challenge, by the way, um, running. I can't remember what the uh, address is for that now. Uh, let's have a look, see if I can find it. Um, but it, it's basically what you can do is uh, you can do a bunch of... Um, GitHub, open source Microsoft Learn modules. Um, and if you've been to DDD's Midlands, which I know both my co-hosts here haven't, uh, then you can enter into a competition uh, to win a Surface Go 2 and a Surface Headphones and things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. It could be somewhere. It's, it's going to be hanging around. I'll put out a tweet anyway at some point uh, reminding you about that. Uh, but anyway, uh, the point I was going to make is those Microsoft Learn modules with uh, for Git, they've got a sandbox for you to be able to do the c Git commands against uh, fake code and make that work, which I thought was a really good idea. I quite like that idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, make pull requests and everything, I think. So, yeah, quite clever. Uh, that was Timescale, by the way, uh, which we mentioned. Uh, that's that one. So you can have the link to that as well, although we talked about that on the show before. Uh, so next up, um, we I've done a little bit of Grafana uh, recently and Prometheus when I was looking at exposing metrics um, uh, for another Pluralsight course that I was updating. Uh, and so I spotted this, how to visualize real-time data from IoT smart home weather station. Now I was hoping Cliff would be um, here because obviously this is going to be doing temperature and humidity and pressure and stuff like that. And I know how much Cliff loves those particular readings. Uh, so uh, I was hoping that uh, it was going to be here, but it also, look, it's got total lightning strikes and total accumulation rainfall. 
uh, and stuff like that in there as well. So um, let me quickly uh, make a uh, that. Let's stick that in the chat. Oops. There we go. We can have a look at that then. Um, helpful weather flow community, but um, yeah, I've not I've not been and read it um, all the way through, but it just looks so cool, and I'd love to spend a bit more time with Grafana um, because it it just looks awesome, and I kind of wish that you could you could sort of style um, um, the portal dashboards in in some way like this. That'd be that'd be so nice. I know there's some work that you can do to to with IoT Central to make you know reasonably pretty dashboards. Uh, but obviously you're locked into IoT Central at that point unless you start, you know, exporting your data and then you know, well you're out of there again. But I mean you can run Prometheus and Grafana in um, either in their own clouds or you can run them uh, in your own VMs in uh, in Azure if you like. But I mean look at that, how cool does that look for weather data mm -hmm. that, that they're pulling? There is actually a uh, a Grafana VM uh, in the in the marketplace. Is there? Uh. Yeah, yeah, and. Um... I tried it out and it, it worked it works it works almost out of the box there's only one thing that for some reason the um, the, the network settings are not done quite well um, so I had to fix that and that was on one of the blogs that I wrote uh, about this oh, uh, was it? oh there we go so um, and it's it's really nice uh, Yeah, there it is. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I just installed it yes. locally on my Edge device uh, to demonstrate it, but that's that's nice, that is. So um, Grafana needs some form of input, uh, and if you're running IoT Edge devices, they expose their metrics in something called the Prometheus Exposition Format, which is like a, a common metrics um, uh, format that you can export it in. It's plain text, if you will, but it's just kind of formatted in a way that uh, Prometheus can understand that Prometheus is a package that that um, aggregates all of these metric sources together. So a standard IoT Edge install with nothing will have two lots of metrics coming out of it, one for the Edge agent and one for the Edge hub. The Edge agent is what's controlling most of the the um, uh, the device, uh, this, yeah, the IoT Edge runtime, if you will. And then the Edge hub is what's dealing with all the communications. And both of those services can be configured by mapping ports to expose their metrics out in this format and then you can use Prometheus to grab them and then you can connect Grafana to Prometheus to be able to surface that data into a dashboard so that's kind of how that again you know go and see my plural site video if you want to see some of that and I've also got a blog on how you can set up IoT Edge to to do that as well um in fact I'll uh, I'll put that on the screen because uh, you know why not uh yeah uh, there configuring and visualizing IoT Edge metrics uh, so I uh, stick just stick the whole link in the chat. Uh, is this the link? Oh yeah, you, uh, Carl, you can't put links uh, in there. Sadly, you can you can put like some spaces or you know redact your own link and it'll it'll pop up in there. But um, yeah, uh, I'm not entirely sure. I'd need to ask Adam uh, Jackson who created the Cloud Skills Challenge whether or not it's specifically for just for people who came to uh, DDD's Midlands or not. We'll need to see uh, what that's about. But if it's open to everybody, then happy days you should do the, the the learning path anyway because you learn even if you've been using git for a while you still learn stuff uh so anyway yeah that's um that's that but yeah i, I that's like what you get in azure the basic dashboards but it's not too far off that with the azure monitor service but there you, you need to go and map ports in the um uh deployment template and once you've done that then uh you can uh all the way down here and you get some metrics that kind of look like that, plain text, but in this particular format uh, for both the the Edge Hub and the Edge device, uh, Edge Hub and the Edge Agent. And then once you've installed Prometheus, then you can add targets to Prometheus, and then that grabs all of that lot at regular scrape intervals, as they call the scrape durations. And then you get uh, add a data source to Grafana, uh, add this Prometheus data source, point it at the Prometheus service, and then you're off and you can create a dashboard and I'm whizzing through it because you can just read the post, but um, you make something that looks kind of like that. 
you know, little dashboards that do that. I made a really simple one just for the purposes of demonstration, but uh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's all right. And um, Sander van der Velder, Sander, just up there, um, his blog post helped me with, with configuring some of that exposition as well. So um, I think I, I must mention you in there somewhere. If I don't, then um, I've been naughty because I did spot that. Um, I have a reader, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, Sander, your your website, and if, if people haven't seen it, uh, then look, it just comes up when I type now because I've got so many of your links um, uh, bookmarked because it's just awesome. It's such a great resource. Um, uh, so look at this. Oh, that uh, sounds familiar. <laughs> that's uh, uh, Sander's latest blog post on there. It's, that's fab as well. Uh, create your own deploy to Azure button. I've not read that one. That's cool. Uh, Things network with IoT hub integration. That was quite cool. Um, but we can we can come back to some of that. Um, but I mean, while we're publicizing links, um, how do we get to your uh, uh, website there, Maria Anastasia? Uh, ooh, if I do that as well, that's going to help. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where are you? Where's your website? Mm, ah, if you oh, click... Is that, what's this? Yeah. There we are. So let me just stick uh, both of these in the chat. Uh, that's Sanders. And then, ah, oh, and I just love the colours on your site. It's awesome. Thank you. Uh, so that's, if I go back up, think about IoT is a great name for a site as well. There we are. And that's Maria Anastasia's site. Actually, if I just go home on that. Uh, Maria Anastasia was just recently on Johnny Chips's. Uh, uh, in conversation with uh, which you know I've still not listened to because I've just been so busy uh, but it's it's definitely on my list of stuff that I need to go and, and have a listen to and this was uh, your blog post about that um, Maria Anastasia you you often uh, will call out the latest uh, IOT news as well and I know that sometimes you do that for, for, for Johnny for his little roving reporter section there mm -hmm. as well which is fantastic um, yeah. look at that mm -hmm. IOT live look, there's us so, yeah, go and check uh, both of those sites out uh, because they're fantastic sources of information. Um, both doing an awesome job. Uh, very, very, uh, very good at what you're doing there. It's great. Yeah. All right. Cool. So that, that, that's where we got to. We went off again. Went off on another little tangent. It's OK. It's fine. It's a talk show. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, so I think, you know, we've got some time to get through some of these. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard. What do you do for compression locally? Do you do any g-zipping either of you for IoT data? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, re recently, I've done a project uh, for a customer, and uh, they asked me, "Well, we have some PLCs, and we want to have some data sent to the cloud." So I said, "Okay, yeah, that's." Is doable, but then they told said, well, "Okay, this is a PLC and it exposes UDP messages, and we want to have it at 50 hertz, so 50 messages a second." Oh. I said, "Well, wait a minute. You want to go with a general purpose operating system and read the data from a PLC?" And then they said, "Well, there are actually two messages that we want to have." And um, so in the end, it, I found out they, they had the ID to extract 75 kilobytes per second out of the uh, PLC diagnostics, um, running motors, um, pumps, stuff, uh, all, all, as, all the movements they want to have in the, in the diagnostics and that sent to the cloud. Um, so I said, OK, if we do that uh, using an IT hub, then within five minutes, you uh, reach your daily quota, <laughs> depending on how much you want to uh, uh, spend, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so what I did, I, I took the messages uh, and I said, OK, maybe 50 is too much. But let's see, uh, make it more uh, flexible that we can scale up or scale down for the number of messages that we get. And uh, by the way, it 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 do, does the job very well. It uh, tens or dozens uh, of, of uh, messages per second that goes okay. 
in a virtualized uh, uh, IoT Edge device. Uh, but uh, the messages are put in a blob storage uh, container. Uh, and uh, those blobs um, are um, each message that I get, uh, the 75 kilobytes, I compress them with uh, GSIP. Yeah. And um, put that in the uh, in the uh, blob storage uh, file on disk, and then the automatic data pump of the blob storage container puts them in a blob storage, the files. Oh. So in that way, I can um, optimize the, <laughs> the the data bundle that they use uh, because uh, this is on a, a ship, so. There's no, not always a, a Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> um, so sometimes they want to move over to a 4G uh, connection. So the compression is uh, welcome. Mm. And, and that's just done with, uh, with GSIP. And um, I, I already did that. Uh, I wrote that, um, that, that piece of logic already a few years ago. Right. Uh, and, but, for another purpose, because there's this um, limit of 250k of a message size, uh, sending one message to the cloud, to, yep. to Azure, to the IT app. Um, and we had a message that was something like 300 or 400 kilobytes. So before right. we sent it, we also compressed it. But, um, right. and that so just compression in memory um and later on i use that same stuff to actually do it with uh, gzip and deflate because if you use those compression techniques you can automatically decompress in a uh, stream analytics job how about that yeah that's true gzip um yeah yeah, that's true. Yeah, otherwise you're into an Azure if, function, if, aren't you, to do it? And then... If you go to an uh, Azure Stream Analytics job to the input and it reads an IT Hub uh, message, there's this uh, decompression uh, uh, dropdown which supports uh, GSIP and uh, Deflate. That's right, yeah. Quite and clever, I never it? used it. I never, And then I said, hey, wait a minute. If I, because I first used my own, well, the, the standard uh, C-sharp uh, compression, a uh, decompression. But then, uh, let's move over to, uh, to uh, and that's the, the standard one is just with like a zip file. Yeah. Uh, with a file structure. Then I moved over to the G-zip uh, and, and the deflate. And it works like a charm. <laughs> of course, you've got to pay for piece? stream analytics, so haven't you? You've got to pay for stream analytics, which is the downside. Um. Yes, uh, <laughs> there's a, 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 a fee, a monthly fee that you have to pay uh, for starters. Yeah. Uh, I, in euros, 75 euros, something like that. Right. And I don't know the exact uh, amount, but that's um, if you only want to deflate stuff, okay, maybe you better put a, uh, a Azure function in between uh, instead of the uh, stream analytics job. Yeah. Uh, and then you get the first few hundred thousand messages for free. That's right. If each, each month, so. Yeah, but good. so decompression, that's uh, and compression. Um, I have not used it for years. And then suddenly <laughs> uh, I found a use for it. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, the reason is I can see, uh, you can see on the screen here, there's, I spotted this heat shrink which is an ultra lightweight compression library for embedded systems. It uses 50 bytes of RAM, which is incredible. <laughs> Don't know how it does that um, uh, in the ESP Reno firmware. So um, so that this is, I guess, you know, for, for Arduino level devices, not for, uh, you know, why would you bother, you know, if you've got a full on Linux system doing something like this. So um, yeah, library, low memory usage, 50 bytes. Um, and yeah, I guess you just get clone and then make it for whatever system you've got AVR GCC for Arduinos. Uh, the decoder takes about one kill, one kilobyte of storage space, so one K. So that's not bad. 
that's pretty small mm -hmm. uh, to get that to work um so yeah i thought that'd be be interesting the, the links there in the chat um and on the screen there so uh, i've not tried this uh, i've not played with it so i don't know how good it is but uh, say there's um some benchmarks here as well um on how well it did um and it just seems like uh, quite a good how it compares to other popular libraries like gzip remember we used 128k for gzip pretty impressive um whereas what did it say it was up there uh, 50 bytes of actual memory um is that storage or mem what, yeah what does it mean uh yeah i don't know that's memory use so it depends what they mean by memory they mean storage memory which would be bad or actual physical in byte in in bytes in memory i'm not quite sure but either way that's a big number I, for gz uh, great if you're running it's, Linux. Doesn't matter, does it? You know, you probably got four gig to play with. <laughs> it's something like the stack or the heap, what they are using. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got to, uh, come, you know, grab a whole heap of data and then run an algorithm across it, haven't you? And and compress. So, uh, how it does it with fifty bytes, I've got no idea. I have no idea <laughs> because because normally you, you try to search for uh, patterns which are reoccurring. And then uh, make a marker for it, and then this you use that single marker for that same competitive uh, solution. Yeah. Yep. Uh, no idea. So if you only have fifty bytes, how how much can you uh, read forward? Or maybe what did it say? Uh, are it? Heatshrink is an open source data compression library. Blah, blah, blah. It works as little as 50 bytes. I wonder if um, maybe that's the decompression side is that as little as 50 bytes of RAM. Decompressing is uh, is relatively straightforward, isn't it? Uh, as you say, you find a marker and go and look up what that marker represents. and It's going back and forth. But, um, well, if... Maybe there's a trade-off be between the, the size of memory used and the, the time spent. If you have time enough, then you can do it uh, with a, a small amount of, of memory. Mm. Yeah, maybe. So, but is it also stating that it's, it's, it's really, really fast? Uh, is there a time comparison also? I'm just looking to see if there is... Uh... Oh, here we are. Uh, compress and encode the latest Linux change log with heat shrink. I uh, don't know what those parameters mean. There's something with those parameters. I think that's window sizing or something. And look ahead of those parameters there. Uh, yeah, 16 milliseconds, 8, eight milliseconds. Um, not sure what, but 1.3 seconds in real time. Not quite sure what the difference between. What are they telling us? There are <laughs> three different numbers. Um, well, that, that that sentence fits in fifty bytes. Yeah. True. Yeah, hard to know. It'll take longer to consume more memory with a larger window size, but the compression ratio is also much better, of course. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Uh, just the optimized blah 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 to decompress for just replace the first argument, and then decompression takes way less time, which is um yeah that makes sense so yeah i mean i'd go with the bigger of those two numbers i think that 1.3 seconds to to compress with a window size of eight and four seconds with a window size of 13 so i guess that's quite slow four seconds in microcontroller terms but it depends what you're doing i suppose mm -hmm. well um we uh, you you already touched that that we we look together at the um uh getting the logs from an edge device uh, yeah. i'm not sure if microsoft put some compression in there too i think they did yeah they, they certainly if you get the support bundle that's a zip so it's definitely yeah. compressed yeah and that takes a while to run but i think that's mainly actually collecting the data rather than zipping it uh, and we're running it on a nice fast raspberry pi um I'm not sure what this has been run on uh, as a test. Um, it doesn't yeah. actually say. 
the interesting part is that they use a, a zip uh, file and the most edge devices that I have are running a Linux uh, solution. So I probably would expect something like tar instead of uh, zip. Yeah, I think he's trying it on his laptop here by the looks of it. Um, mind you, yeah, he's building it on his actual laptop and then running it on his laptop. So if that's taking four seconds on his laptop, that's that's going to be really slow elsewhere, isn't it? <laughs> Jeez. Uh, I've got no idea how how long compression takes on an, an Arduino. I've not done it. So uh, I can't tell you if that is a long time or not, but it, it seems like a long time to me. Anyway, that's that's that. That's um, heat shrink. So go and check that one out. Uh, 50 bytes is crazy, says Carl. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, yeah, the inverse square for Quake 3, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Um, they, 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 had to, they created some special function, didn't they, to make that really fast uh, over at ID Software. I remember that. Right, uh, moving on quickly because we've got not very long left. Um, there's an, a Qualcomm IoT as a service. I've not read this particular thing. Uh, but Qualcomm, basically, they, they make um, uh, uh, communications chips, don't they, I think, Qualcomm? Uh, aren't they the Chinese supplier, the one that uh, the Americans don't like, Qualcomm? Seem to remember, or I could be wrong. Um, no, there, it definitely isn't. That's, that is the US one. I forget who the the um, uh, the Chinese one is that they don't like, but either way. Um, yeah, launched last year with an insufficient fanfare for us to cover it it says here i'll zoom in It'll be a bit easier um yeah directly ad address the fragmented nature of the iot industry so i'm just going to paste a link straight in the chat for that one um i've not read it so uh, it looks like there's there's a, a video that you can go and watch uh, to find out a little bit about it so you can go check that one out uh there is a, oh this is cool Somebody's made their own uh, DIY ebook reader um, using a, I think it's a, uh, oh yeah, an ESP32 and a, and a little um, uh, uh, e-paper screen. So I like that. Great, yeah. I think it was quite expensive um, when I looked at how much it had cost. Uh, everything's on GitHub just there. I'm sure it was quite That's expensive. a large uh, e papers mm. e paper screen, so those are gone not for cheap. Yeah, exactly. I think that was the problem. Um yeah. uh, I think it was mainly that screen. I think they they might talk about it in the uh um in the video there. So uh the, I've put a chat a, a link in the chat there for that, but um, you'll be able to search for it if you're not following along um, anyway. But yeah, that was quite cool. I like the look of that. Um, mm -hmm. Looks like it goes through the whole thing there. So worth checking that one out. And then there's a uh, the GitHub just here for that as well. So check that one out. Uh, actually, that just about fit on the screen so I can leave that one. Um, this looked cool. Uh, Arduino plant water management system using Cliff's favourite BME 280 mm -hmm. temperature, humidity and pressure device. Um, and actually, it, it was quite a complicated little thing. It, it did quite a lot. There was quite a lot of components in it. Um, so we've not got time to, to go to go through it all, but I'll stick the link in the chat for that one as well. Um, but yeah, this uh, these, these, these are quite common, these little displays, these little OLED displays. Are quite common but it looks like yeah. a really good job of it it looks really good and i've mm -hmm. used the pcb way before and and kicad i've used both these um uh, bits pcb way make quite nice uh, pcbs there kicad an open source uh, pcb um, and schematic design application um yeah it's like little uh, little this maths that they put into it to work out what Whoa. the flow rate of the water was through this uh, and then looking at uh, evaluating the approximate evaporation rates based on temperature, humidity, and pressure. So I know uh, Cliff. If I mean, I don't, I don't think you're actually in the chat there, Cliff, because you're probably in bed. Um, but if you watch this back, uh, this is this looks like an actual good use of temperature, and humidity, and pressure. Uh, certainly, if you're going to go to this much effort and put, look at that. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm back at university doing integration and stuff like that um yeah that that was this is impressive when i was looking through this um 
And yeah, it was an Arduino Nano, so yeah. It just looked good as well and made it into a little teardrop. Um, it's cool. So yeah, yeah, go and check that one out. Um, it's well worth checking out. In fact, let me make a bit.ly for that one. Uh, that will do. I'm going to stick that one on the screen. There we go. Um, I've heard of these temperature and humidity sensors can be wildly out if not calibrated. Um, yeah, actually, the BME 280, and certainly if you get an Adafruit one, uh, they're pretty accurate. Um, there will be a little bit of calibration if you want them all to read the same, uh, but they're, they're pretty accurate just out of the box. But if you use something like a, a DHT11 or something like that, then they're terrible. Uh, they're great at just telling you it's hot or cold, uh, but don't try and use them for anything particularly uh, important. Um, and But yeah, for a weather station, um, then yeah, they're great. Um, and they'll they'll pretty much just work. Uh, I think we discussed this on the on the show the other day. The downside of, with a lot of those BME and BMP two eighties is that um, they're not a hundred percent beginner friendly. Even though that's where most people start, because you've got to solder them. They come um, just with uh, a set of pins, and you've got to solder them before you can actually make use of it. So there is a little bit of a downside with that. Um, but yeah it's not too bad what was the chip bme 280 yeah there's bme and then bmp 280 and uh i forget i think you get pressure or something um with a bmp that you don't get with a bme or something like that so um yeah go check that one out that was cool um this isn't particularly iot based but if you're in iot and you do talks uh i don't know uh in fact maria anastasia have you given any talks yet Mm, I have um, some. I have some time that I haven't uh, given any talk. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know when uh, I will um, give it up again. Uh huh. Well, we'll have to have you at not IoT. Uh, we've had Sander Van der Velde there at the top right hand corner. He's come and. Uh, and spoken at Knots IoT at least once. I think we're, we're going to have you back after Christmas as well, aren't we, uh, Sander? Um, mm -hmm. For another talk. So, um, uh, yeah, you most certainly have to um, come along. Um, isn't the I, I don't have we spoken to you about this? Um, but if, did you see the tweet from from Adam Jackson um, uh, today about the uh, tech days that Cliff and I are um, organising? Did you see that tweet? Um, so uh, I was going to come to both of you pair and ask whether or not you wanted to get involved with that and give a talk as part of that. Um, you could pre-record it, which is nice. So it doesn't have to be recorded live, but you'd come on and do Q&A uh, afterwards. But I, I'll probably do my bit live because I'm uh, crazy like that. But um, yeah, so we could chat offline anyway about that and see what your thoughts are. I know um, I can't remember, Maria Anastasia, if you got involved with anything that we did before, like all around Azure, but I know, Sander, you, you did get involved uh, and you gave a talk at that, didn't you? So, uh, yeah, we'll have a talk offline and see what you say. But uh, if you've not seen that particular tweet from Adam, let me get that on the screen uh, here. And I'll just bring that down here. There we go. Ugh. There we are. So you ready for this? So um, it's it's a short, so two and a half hour show, and we're going to go through uh, how we can use IoT to track um, uh, real life uh, plane journeys, um, and we're going to grab the data, uh, including I hope temperature and humidity, but also things like uh, wind speed and altitude and direction. Uh, and then do some stuff with that. So it's going to be quite interesting to to go through that. So we're going to have like five short talks and a QA and a session after each. Um, you know, sort of 15, 20 minute talk, I think, and a, a, like a 10 minute uh, Q&A afterwards. So pretty short. Uh, right. So that's going to be the idea of that. So um, yeah, let's chat offline about it. But if you're interested, then it'd be good to have you both along. Um, but it, yeah, it'll be the uh, Monday, the 15th of November. Um, which is just a couple of days before I hopefully jet off to Lithuania, to Vilnius, uh, to go and speak at the Build Stuff conference, assuming that we all get to go and do that. So um, Nice. Yeah, so we'll we'll have IoT planes, and then I'll get on a real-life plane after that. So, yeah, that'll be good. 
Uh, right, moving swiftly on. Uh, this was cool. I saw a 30 second blood uh, analysis uh, project here done with the Raspberry Pi, which was pretty cool. Um, uh, back to yeah, back to Pi, Pi Maroni again, says Carl. Uh, bad news for your wallet. Yeah, but good news for, for fun and good news for uh, the fab folks at Pi Maroni as well. They do a fantastic job. Um, yeah, I've not I've not uh, looked in great detail about what this is doing, but um, it looks pretty cool um, to be able to, to test blood samples in 30 seconds with um, you know, Raspberry Pi and all of that stuff on the right hand side. <laughs> so it's quite uh, complicated. Um, so yeah, that looked quite cool. Uh, what's that? Up there. I don't even know what that is. Mm -hmm. Real player. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the Raspberry Pi jukebox, which was quite cool. Um, and then, uh, yeah, hold on a minute. I'm going to just get rid of access right in my way. Oh, I can't. <coughs> oh, now my whole computer's just gone on a, on a go slow. Uh Oh, I can't do anything now. Oh. Tell you what, let's, let's switch to us three for a second. And Sander, uh, what is the latest project that you've just worked on while my computer just decides to have a mare? I can't do anything. It's completely locked up. <clears throat> the, the latest project? Um, well, I'm uh, currently looking into uh, the, the, the Laureate, uh, I, uh, LoRa platform. Ah, it okay. It's a uh, one of the the major providers for uh, for LoRa networks, and um, well, I, I I have some stuff laying around with with LoRa, so uh, I was thinking, okay, let's let's look at the other uh, platform, and um, how to get it connected to Azure, of course. So and they have a uh, a nice uh, Azure IoT Hub uh, integration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, and it's it's documented, so it, it took me uh, a few hours, and then I got my uh, telemetry uh, in, and um, I'm now struggling with the uh, with the um, the actual packages coming from from the sensor to get them uh, trans transformed because. Um, they just uh, pass the raw message from the device, uh, from the sensor, through to the IT hub. So I probably have to put an, uh, an Azure function uh, behind it uh, to to decrypt or decode the uh, the, the, the the payload. Uh -huh. The payload uh, LoRa uh, devices they can only send something like 51 bytes of of data in one message. But normally it's just a few bytes, and that uh, because the, the shorter the message, the shorter the time you need for sending a, a message. Yep. So there's little uh, less chance that the, the, the sending the message corrupts, and you have to retransmit and try again and try again and try again. The whole so, point is to keep it low power, isn't it? So the less time you're doing stuff, the, and the better. It every is. time you have to you do a retransmit, you're eating up a little bit of the battery. Yeah. So um, um, short messages uh, in, in size, small uh, uh, messages. That's that's the key. Uh, but yeah, if you have three or four or five values. You have to squeeze it in into those, yeah, a few bytes, and uh, yeah, and it's up to you to decompress it also, of to de de decode it. And uh, luckily, most vendors they provide some kind of logic in in JavaScript, uh, but now I have to take that stuff that they have into, uh, I think a. Uh, a, an Azure function running Node.js, I think. That's ah, okay. most easy. Something like that. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I, I, I can rebuild it in, in Python or C Sharp, but then I'm just rewriting the same logic. So if I can actually copy-paste it and put it in an Azure function, that would be nice. Sounds good. Uh, right, so I'm just going to rush through these last few um, uh, tabs here. This looked dead cool. 
Uh, so this is an RFID jukebox. So these little RFID cards, you tap them on that um, RFID sensor there and it gives you a, a playlist uh, that you pre-programmed. Uh, I mean, it's a toy, uh, but I like that. And that this is a one of those continuous rotation, um, uh, I don't know uh, what you'd call those, um, but it spins round and it, you just get a taco based on the fact that it's moved and you can tell which way it's moved, but... Um, yeah, you could spin through your tracks using that, and then it was like a, a, a forward and back button on there as well, and that was using a um, uh, uh, a um, uh, Raspberry Pi Zero, which is quite cool. Um, not seen many people use those recently. I'm really hoping that we get an upgraded Raspberry Pi Zero at some point because they you know, for a fiver uh, or however much they were, or a tenner, I think really by the time you bought it. And they were a fantastic piece of kit, but just massively underpowered. Um, it'd be fantastic if we could get like a, a Raspberry Pi 4 processor uh, based uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. That'd be quite nice. There, uh, there are these uh, compute modules. Yes, from CM4. Pi. They're expensive though, aren't they? Yes, but yeah. they, they are ideal uh, to put more next to each other. So it, yes. that makes it even more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah i've seen people do that as well it's um yeah uh crazy uh what people can do with those cm4 modules um uh, i've not heard of pop linux uh pop os linux not heard of that before but however it is that wrote this particular story uh seems to think that it's awesome uh and however it is that created Jer uh, jeremy soler there he's he's tweeted this image and uh if you if you zoom in you can just about see it's. This is on a Raspberry Pi 400. That's the Raspberry Pi built into a keyboard uh, device. I like that. I've got one in there uh, that my daughter, uh, my daughters both use. So, um, yep, go check that one out. I'll stick uh, the link in the chat for that. Um, uh, just about fit on the screen. Be all right. So uh, much information today about Linux and. No mention to Windows 11. I know. Yeah, other than me asking uh, Sander up there if he was using Windows 11 when he couldn't find the sound settings, which weren't there anyway. Um, I, in fact, um, I tried to put it on a really old Dell laptop uh, because I didn't want to put it on either of these two machines uh, because I need them for streaming and uh, it would be a nightmare. But And I saw Troy Hunt, Hunt was um, having trouble getting Windows 11 on his machine as well. So I'm not particularly inclined... To start looking at Windows 11 yet. Have, have either of you looked at it? Uh, Maria Anastasia has. Time. Yeah, time. time. Yeah. What do you reckon, Maria Anastasia? Is it is it any good? Ah, uh, no. I I meant that. Uh, me neither. Oh, um, see, right. Yeah. 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 Time. <laughs> time. <laughs> right. Priorities. Yeah. Uh, I looked at this quickly. This is um, uh, using um, uh, an MQTT client to talk to Azure IoT Hub. So rather than the SDKs, not something I've done. I've always just tend to stuck to the SDKs. Uh, but this uses uh, the OPC router MQTT client plugin here, um, which I thought was quite interesting. I've not heard of that before. So I'm just going to stick the links in the chat to that. Um, and what did I spot when I was looking through it? I spotted something which was quite interesting. Um, they were getting data out in an interesting way, I'm sure. Or maybe I, <clears> maybe it was just this. I've not heard of OPCC OPC uh, router before. Yeah, it must have been that. Maybe it's the next one that I thought was interesting. Uh, oh, geez, yeah, embedded boards. I mean, um, we've talked about Raspberry Pi and ESP32 and Arduino in general. Uh, on this show even, but um, in, in the past and, and today as well. But this thing for edge AI processing is a monster. There's no price, but look, it's got 128 gig of RAM, four SATA hard drives, uh, uh, yeah, 100 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, uh, yeah, 256 gigabyte of EMCC and um, loads of networking. <laughs> Just a monster. Um uh, just, I'd, I'd never seen a board like it. But I, even at the bottom of this, it, I mean, look at it. It looks like a CM4, doesn't it, to a degree? Uh, but it's not. That's not a CM4. Uh, it should come as no surprise that pricing has not been made publicly available. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine 
many hundreds of pounds uh, is the answer to the pricing question. But jeez, uh, that's just mental. But I think they even say that it's you know, look this the embedded platform targets low power IIoT. H- how is that going to be low power? <laughs> I can't imagine it personally, but happy to be proved wrong. Jeez. Well, it, it it seems to be a development board, so this is not something that you normally put in an, an actual product. Eh? You you yeah. try out what what you what you need, and then you uh, take everything away that you don't need, and then you have your uh, your actual solution. Yeah, I guess that's what this is. So that is probably the production board, and it's on a uh, a, a dev board of some sort, a carrier dev board there, by the looks of it. Where it's all the GPIOs all exposed and SATA connectors and that's not SATA that's a uh, PCIe edge connector. Um, not sure where the SATA connectors are on that actually, but oh there no that's US. Oh, I don't know. Either way, uh, oh there they are. There they are. They're hiding up there. Um, yeah, so th- I, I spotted that. I just thought that's just how about a uh, a fan on top of it? Yeah, that would help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then one more link uh, uh, pushing data to Azure Time Series Insights uh, using uh, Azure Injector I've never heard of that is that something you've you've heard of you pair not heard of that before no. Azure Injector uh, so there's, there's like a quick start and stuff there I'm just going to stick this in the chat there um, it was that and then further on down they were, they were getting information back out uh, I'm sure what was it? Da, da, da. This is all TSI, which we which um, we've spoken about on the show before. Um, pushing data to Time Series Insight using Azure, maybe it's just this Azure Injector that I thought was interesting because I've I've not heard of that before. So um, yeah, viewing the data in Time Series Insights makes sense. Um, yeah, Time Series Insights is good. Um, we do like TSI, but it costs money like everything in Azure. So, yeah. So the link's in the chat there to that. And look, look, we're at quarter past 10, which is in, in Maria Anastasia's time, I know that that's uh, quarter past 12. Now, what time is it with you, Sander? Is, is it quarter past 11? or In between uh, quarter past 11, yes. Yeah, so, oh, geez. so you're yeah. both even more tired than I am. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, call it quits uh, for today. Um, thank you again for joining us, uh, Sander van der Velde, and obviously thank you very much, Maria and Anastasia, for, for joining us as always. Uh, hopefully uh, our Cliff will be uh, back on, on next week's show and bright as a, as a button. Uh, assuming we're on next week, I think we are. Um, uh, I don't see any reason why not. The, the following week, though, um, is, is half term, so I don't think there's going to be a show. What is it? The 12th? Yeah, the 19th. I don't think there'll be a show in the on that week, so um come back next week and get your dose of iot live um knowing that you're going to miss a week um so and yeah so um thank you very much again and we will see you in uh a week see you later mm-hmm. bye, bye.